doing 90 in a Corvette, swerving. I had a bottle of, I don't remember, some sort of whiskey. I lost a cap, so I just had this half gallon sitting between my legs. I thought we would uh, extend last week's um, episode on DUI stops. Let's do some pot stops because this is a probably more common than DUI stops for younger folks, wouldn't it be? I mean, I'm not sure what the numbers are. Um, whether it's it's more common to be stopped for it or to have that be the excuse that they use to search the car, I'd say it's it's certainly probably the most prominent excuse that is used to search vehicles. I'm just thinking about my own life experience. You they know, they smell like, weed. They always smell weed, especially if you're young. If you're if you're 19, you get pulled over for speeding. They're gonna smell weed in your car. You well, most 19 year olds do smell like pot. I mean, let's be honest. I certainly did. Yeah. <laughs> as you can't as smoke I it could. at home. You got to get in your car and go for a drive and smoke it. You know? And that's drive. when they get you. <laughs> They're on to us. Can it be a Land Rover, possibly? Hello. 10-4. 10-4, clear valid. Man, where are you spraying? Just spraying things in here? What are you doing? Put the window all the way down, 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 down for me. Cool. What are you doing? I need to start making notes. There's the stop. So he already messed up, right? He rolled the window down completely. And yeah. the, officers, the officer was slick here, right? He pulled up and knocked on the rear window to get him to yeah. roll down all the windows, basically, right? Is that what he's doing yeah. here? Fourth. Yeah, it's, it seems so, yeah. But yeah, so you don't have to roll down your windows, by the way. Or you don't, you don't have to roll it all the way down. As long as you have enough space to communicate, that's all. He can ask you to do it, but you don't have to comply. He gets him to roll down, like, all of his windows, basically. And he's seen him, the reason he pulled him over is was he sees, he's seen him spraying the spray. I never understood the spray. It's not going to mask the odor of marijuana. It's just going to, you know, add to the volume of odor. And th so that was why he pulled him over? Well, he wasn't aware of his seatbelt. Um, okay. His window tint was too dark, of course. Obviously. This is Florida. Oh, that's not. But he's seen him spraying shit. Um, yeah, is which is why that, he felt like it was suspicious that he was spraying it, and that's why I pulled him over. Well, it is kind of suspicious if, you know, you're a cop and you drive by somebody and they start spraying shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we already saw one little, we already saw one thing he did wrong, but there's plenty more we'll get to, um, okay. we'll get into at the end here, but let's go through it. So the first thing they'll do is ask if you've consumed any drugs or alcohol. Don't admit to consuming any drugs or alcohol. Obviously this is, um, you know, they'll lull you into a false sense of security, feel like your buddy, and then they'll ask you questions. You gotta, you gotta be on your guard, man. So the question, if he smells pot, um, in some states, it is probable cause to search the vehicle just for smelling pot. Um, either way, it's reasonable suspicion to pull you out of the vehicle. The states where it is probable cause, um, Arizona, Oklahoma, Michigan, Florida, Ohio, and most other states, it is probable cause to search the vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, some states it's not. For example, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Illinois, uh, Washington, D.C., Maryland in general. Colorado, North Dakota, and Kentucky. It's not probable cause to search the vehicle just because they smell marijuana. And I wanted to make a point here. You can pretty much, like if you've ever been to a major city, they all smell like pot now. Every major city in the United States smells like pot now at all times. They can use this excuse basically for any traffic stop in the city. Yeah, yeah. I uh, me and my girlfriend were out last night uh, walking down Frankfurt Avenue. There's a bunch of lovely restaurants up in that area. And uh, there's Multiple vehicles I walk by just we're, while we're walking down the street, just everybody's smoking weed. So it's it's, it's so it's ubiquitous. ubiquitous so at this common. Point, yeah. yeah, everyone's doing it, and it's you know, uh, cops are just having a, in the places where I guess they can use it as probable cause. Probable cause they're having a field day with it, and even states like this where they don't, they can't. I guess technically use it as probable cause. They're still going to use it as something to get you to submit to, to letting them search the vehicle or get right. you to ad admit to it. You know, this a lot of little things like this that they use were in and of itself, they can't use that as evidence to, or, or use that for justification to search you or, or evidence for anything in court. 
they can bring it up and they can get you to tell on yourself, which is 90% sure. of what ends up happening in these uh, these situations. You end up just telling on yourself, giving yourself up, putting yourself in a situation you didn't need to be in. Well, even if you do everything right, it's still reasonable suspicion to pull you out of the vehicle and to initiate a DUI investigation. Um, mm -hmm. So that's we're assuming here that we do everything right in this particular stop. He'll pull you out of the vehicle. He could do the um, horizontal gaze nystagmus, the follow my finger test. He could do that one. Shouldn't really show clues for most drugs. Um, they'll, they'll, they'll look for dilated pupils, obviously, draw on amphetamines or like uh, tryptamines. They'll look for glassy eyes, for marijuana. But other than that, there's not a whole lot that you can determine with the um, horizontal gaze and stagma test. The field sobriety tests are mostly what they rely on for drug stops. Um, I have some experience with this, um, but I, I feel like it's not super common unless you're really fucked up, like on Xanax and stuff, mm -hmm. falling over, that, that, that they're going to sort of go down this road, unless they find something in the vehicle, and then you're automatically going to get hit with the DUI. But the goal here is to prevent that um, scenario um, at all costs. Um, and I'm recommending here that you try to record the stop with your phone however you can to get as much video evidence as possible to uh, defend you in court. The field sobriety test is the main way that they will develop probable cause if it's one of those states where they uh, can't use the smell or you don't have the smell. Um, you know, could be prescription drugs or anything they can give you a DUI for. They could give you a DUI for nutmeg if they want to, you know. Yeah, they, they could try. They could they could pull you into jail. They could arrest you. They could make you spend the night and try to get you to plea out, you know. whether get you, Yep. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's how these things go. Like, most people are not going to go to trial for something like this. They're going to go going to get arrested that night, get out hopefully the next morning, I get dragged through court and probation for a few months, and then they're going to end up getting some sort of offer to, to come in and serve another weekend or two, and you just plea out. So, Well, you wind up paying like $1,200 in the process. Yeah, you, you end up Minimum. paying a lot. So the, the technicalities of what's going to hold up in court don't really apply to these unless you want to really invest the time and money to, to make them apply. Okay, so if you don't tell on yourself in the first part, they pull you out of the vehicle, you do the sobriety testing, you pass the sobriety testing uh, with flying colors, they will ask you at this point if they can search the vehicle. They always do this. Um, tell them no. They will try to pressure you into it. They will try every trick in the book. They'll threaten you with all the crimes you've been committing, um, real or imagined. They'll find any little thing they can to sort of pressure you into it. Tell them no. If they, if they ask you to search, you refuse, and you're recording this uh, encounter, um, like a lot of times what they'll do is they'll say, oh, well, th then I find probable cause this, this way. You know, that, that's, that's not going to look good in court for them. If, they, if they've been refused to search the vehicle and then they, then they suddenly find probable cause, that's not going to look great on them. So if they decide yeah. that they do have probable cause, they will search the vehicle. Um, what constitutes probable cause? Um, so these are what you what they can search the vehicle for, basically, if you don't allow them to. A DUI arrest, so if they have enough clues to um, arrest you for DUI, then they will search the vehicle. If they smell pot in most states, as we covered, they will search the vehicle um, without asking, which is what happens to this gentleman. If there is any visible evidence of contraband, uh, illegal contraband, they will search the vehicle. Or if you admit to uh, some sort of crime, they will search the vehicle at that point, uh, subsequent to arrest. A difference with the um, the alcohol DUI is uh, for the drug DUI, they're going to want you to do a blood draw. I don't think I've ever done this. Um, I, I haven't. I've had uh, two DUI, three DUI arrests, two for alcohol, one for uh, drugs, marijuana. And uh, yeah, I was young, stupid, and I just I told on myself almost immediately. So <laughs> they didn't really have to do any of that other stuff. You know, they had they're slick. Camera admitting it. Yeah, I, with slick. the alcohol, there was like, there was no question. There was no bullshit in my way out of that one. I was well and truly drunk. <laughs> yeah, I was doing 90 in a Corvette, swerving. Um, and there, <laughs> the guy followed me for like four miles. I never knew it. And I'm just like speeding right along at three in the morning. Hiss drunk. Had, had a bottle of, I don't remember, some sort of whiskey. I lost a cap, so I just had this half gallon sitting between my legs and a, a loaded pistol in the seat right beside me. Well, that's how do. we used to roll, dude. That's uh, yeah. <laughs> that's what you do when you're 20. You pull you're over. 20. It's like, have you been drinking? Uh, I literally just look up. I'm like, I uh, can't remember. No, no. <laughs> you know, no, I've got the bottle of whiskey. He's just like holding the flashlight right on it. Like, what do you want me to say, man? 
All right. So what they'll do with the blood draw here, um, they will ask you if they can do the blood draw if they have to. If they don't have probable cause uh, to search the vehicle or probable cause of some sort of crime, if there's no smell of pot, basically, or if you are in a state where pot smell isn't enough and they want to pursue a DUI investigation, they will um, ask you to submit to a blood draw or breathalyzer if they have reasonable suspicion that you were under the influence of any sort of drug or alcohol. If you choose the uh, breathalyzer and you blow zeros, then they can uh, force you to do the blood draw, basically. So maybe if you're out uh, um, doing drugs and driving, maybe have a couple beers with it. I don't know if that would help or not, but... <laughs> If you refuse the blood draw, refusal to submit to blood draw is not probable cause for arrest in and of itself, but may be used in court in most states. Many states can easily get an electronic warrant for a blood draw in a short period of time. Um, they're supposed to have evidence, though. The judge is supposed to have evidence, but typically they just sign it off. And uh, with, the, with the blood draw, it's not as bad as the breathalyzer because even... If you have drug metabolites in your blood, it's not conclusive evidence that you were under the influence. You know, if you if you pass the um, sobriety tests, but you have metabolites in your blood, you know, it's it's up to the jury really to determine. And what are the so on the blood test? Uh, is that something that can be refused? Well, I, I guess you can. You can refuse it the same as you'd refuse any of the other field sobriety tests, right? Or the breathalyzer. Um. It is considered the same uh, under the under the state laws as um, refusing the breathalyzer. Okay, so as will... refusing because there's there's two. I believe you can refuse the field breathalyzer, but the one at the jail is the one that you can get in trouble for refusing, if memory serves. So I guess because it's it's calibrated better. Or... Yeah, you're right. The, uh, the the portable breathalyzer the police have is not admissible in court uh, whatsoever. Okay. It's only used for uh, probable cause for arrest. Mm. It's less accurate. The one at the jail, the intoxilizer, that is the one where you lose your license for a year if you uh, refuse it because of the implied consent laws. And the same thing goes for the uh, blood draw. The difference being if you blow .08 in the intoxilizer, you're definitely going to get hit with DUI because that's the legal limit. There's no legal limit for metabolites in your blood, for uh, especially like marijuana. You know, it's in your blood for so long. And also, um, let me go through this uh, point by point so I don't lose track here. Okay. Let's have this pretty lady tell us all about it. This is California law, so it's a bit different. But um... what we need to see is how much of the Delta 9 THC was in your blood at the time of the test and how much of the carboxy. THC was in your blood at the time of the test. What's the difference between the two? Well, if you're someone who consumes a lot of cannabis or consumes it regularly, you will almost always come up positive for carboxy. That's the latent component of marijuana or THC that's in your blood. That is not going to make you high. It has no impact on your impairment. So just because you came up positive for the latent component or the carboxy metabolite, does not mean that you were impaired at the time of driving. What prosecutors rely on is that Delta 9 number. And some experts will say that if you are above a certain threshold, five nanograms per milliliter, let's say, of Delta 9 THC, that you must have been impaired for the purposes of driving. But here's the thing, cannabis does not work like alcohol. There is no number correlated to impairment the way there is for alcohol. So the the, uh, the the regular old blood draw that they do only has a positive negative um, for these drugs, but you can request a comprehensive metabolite panel. And that's what the defense attorneys here are recommending you do. Um, that way it shows exactly what was in your system at that time. Because a blood draw obviously shows what's in your system, what actives are in your system, right? Um, so if you're showing, if you're showing, you know, just carboxy and not Delta 9, then you haven't smoked in, you know, hours. And you're fine. Yeah. That, that's pretty good defensive um, evidence. If you are unconscious at the time of the uh, stop, they can do a blood draw without a warrant, thanks to the implied consent laws. So if you crash and you're, you know, you wreck your car, and they take you to the hospital, they're going to draw your blood, basically. Yeah, I think that's it's probably more uh, uh, 
more something people with uh, op- that opiate DUIs would have to worry about. I've known several people that have nodded completely off while driving or while parked somewhere and wake up in the hospital and they have to deal with stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, one, one, um, one thing of note here, if you say you wreck your car, right, and you get away, you get home, once you're home, if the police show up at your home then, they can't force you to do a blood draw at that point. Hmm. So because I guess because you're not driving at that point, so it's not a. They're not allowed. They're not allowed to because of um, some some legal cases, um, precedents. But they wouldn't be able to use it really anyway because so much time has elapsed, and you could just say you drank when you got home, right? Yeah. But they can't. They can't even. They can't force you to do it anyway if you make it home. So it's not like that. That I guess chain of custody would be the r- wrong word, but that. We, we they didn't find you at the scene and were able to get a hold of you then. There's there's time had elapsed enough time that had elapsed that you could have drank later. Or your levels would be substantially different from when you had the had the wreck. So it's not as messy. Should you always refuse the blood draw? This is these are always complicated. You know, there's you have to weigh your pros and cons. Um, if you have felony contraband in the vehicle then, you know, in my opinion, losing your license is the least of your uh, concerns, you know, refuse it. There's no reason not to at that point. If you have a large amount of actives in your system at the time of the stop, um, you're probably going to be arrested anyway if your car reeks a pot. Um, I think also it's point, just to point it out, I thought of this when the lady was talking about the Delta 9 versus the THC carboxy levels. Uh, it also kind of depends on, like, it's all important stuff, and it's all incredibly relevant to whether or not you were uh, uh, impaired when you were driving. Um, it's also important to point out that these distinctions are most like, so like here and where you and I live or in this area, these distinctions are going to be lost on the judges and the prosecutors, certainly any jury members, or they might not care. Um, I had a... Uh, during my second DUI, I had to do my classes. I, I distinctly remember this. The woman teaching the class, we were having this discussion about marijuana and specifically, and, and she's saying, well, yeah, you know, these things can show up in your system for uh, a month, up to a month later, you know, if you find this stuff in your system. And and she kept, wasn't even implying, she was outright saying that that means that you are impaired for a month after smoking a joint. and. I was I've kind of always been a contrarian. I spoke up. I was like, it's not correct. You know, these are metabolites. I'm not a pharmaceutical student or anything like that. But, you know, <laughs> I knew well enough to, to try to explain to her that these are metabolites and they're not psychoactive. And they, they just show that you use the chemical, whatever drug it was at some point. And, and it's, it's not a, a sign of impairment. But point being, older people... I think you have to be careful with this stuff because these finer distinctions aren't necessarily uh, uh, going to mean anything to a lot of these prosecutors and judges. Well, that's a good point. You know, um, anytime you're talking about the American criminal justice system, yeah. I mean, you have to realize that the truth isn't always good enough. Um, yeah, or, or the science, the facts, it doesn't sure. necessarily matter. Um. Uh, as I was saying, um, if you have a large amount of actives in your system, uh, but you fa- if you if you pass the um, the uh, all the the field sobriety testing, then the only evidence they could potentially have is the blood draw. So if you refuse the blood draw, you could definitely have your case tossed out. If they can get a warrant, then let them get the warrant. Uh, refusal to submit blood is the same as refusing the intoxilizer. You will have your license suspended for the duration of the case. And then at up to 18 months if you're convicted. And um, one thing I wanted to point out here, you cannot get a hardship license if you refuse the intoxilizer or the blood draw. We talked about that a little bit last week. I wanted to make that point clear for everybody. So this is a deci- this is one of those decisions you have to weigh your pros and cons. Um, if you've already failed the, uh, the, uh, the field sobriety testing, say they smell pot, and you feel the... Fa- Fail the field sobriety testing. Well, refusing the blood draw is not really going to help you. You're going to lose in court anyway at that point. 
So if everything else you're good and you know you're good and you didn't tell on yourself, if you didn't fail the field sobriety testing, if they didn't smell pot because you weren't smoking when you were driving because you're responsible, then refuse the damn thing. That's the last piece of evidence they could potentially have against you. That would be my um, recommendation if you know you have actives in your system. Yeah, sure. And just just start off. Try not to even let it get to that point. Uh, start off the investigation sure. just denying everything and, and invoking your Fifth Amendment right. This is also something I meant to say last week. Uh, just being silent can be used against you in court. If you are wanting to invoke your Fifth Amendment rights, you have to vocalize that. You have to say, I'm invoking my rights. I'm, I'm choosing to remain silent. I am choosing not to incriminate myself. I'm invoking the Fifth. Vocalize those. The, the cop is going to conduct an investigation. Uh, you Let them conduct their investigation. You don't have to aid their investigation. You don't have to give them anything other than your name, you know, your, your identification, any documentation about the vehicle you're driving, anything like that. Anything else, they have to find it out. Don't help them. That protects you from getting, hopefully, from getting to the point where these things start getting brought up, where the field sobriety tests start getting up, and intoxilizer and breathalyzer and all that stuff. You could probably, in some cases, certainly, you could prevent even getting to that point by just shutting your mouth, giving them as little information as possible and and reminding them that they cannot hold you there forever. If they don't have a uh, reason to keep you, they have to let you go after a certain point. I, I think different states have different uh, different standards on how long a traffic stop can a traffic stop can take, but you know, generally if if they don't have anything kind of solid to hold you, it seems like around 15 to 20 minutes is is as long as they can keep you there. Uh, you know, unless you give yourself up or you're very obviously drunk or have some warrants, something like that. But. Yeah, the timing on that is arbitrary. It's supposed to be reasonable, whatever that means. Um, yeah, it's, you have it's 20 minutes it's, it's, is what they say. Yeah, reasonable to conduct, conduct an investigation. I think with most, it would be somewhere in that range, 15 to 20, 25 minutes, something like that. And but, it's a good point you bring up about just, the Fifth Amendment, too, because they if you do invoke your fifth amendment rights they can't bring that up in court they can't say he invoked his yeah. fifth amendment rights they can't even mention it they're not supposed yeah, to yeah they can't do that they can bring up silence and this is this was from the DUI I guy I really this. That makes yeah, sense i learned but... this from him if you just stay silent don't say anything they can't hold that against you you have to at some point verbalize i'm invoking my rights whatever and this is also where you it's very important to have uh, some sort of recording device whether it's recording video or recording audio just something to where you can prove at least what was said what you said yeah just invoke your rights and uh be polite to the officer don't answer any questions and continue to ask them if their investigation is up and are you being detained and am i free to go hopefully they, they don't that. get enough to even, <laughs> yeah I love when you do that one. <laughs> audio's good, but video's better if you can get it. Uh, but at least audio, yeah, for sure, man. Yeah. Um, if they determine that they have probable cause for arrest, they will then search the vehicle. Um, and what they're saying is that they have evidence, they believe that you, they have ev evidence that you were under the influence while driving. They will search the vehicle, but that them, them finding something in the vehicle isn't evidence of probable cause. That's, ev that's post facto evidence, right? So... If the court determines they didn't have reasonable suspicion for the stop, for if there's, for say, dash cam footage and you were driving perfectly fine, but they find 100 kilos of cocaine, it doesn't matter, it's getting thrown out because they didn't have reasonable suspicion. Same thing goes with probable cause. If they did, if the court determines they didn't have probable cause for the arrest, the, the whole case can be thrown out regardless of what they find uh, after the search. So bear that in mind, guys. That's why it's so important to do everything right um, and get as much evidence as you can. Kentucky law. Kentucky state law currently only allows police to get search warrants for blood draw in DUI cases that involve death or physical injury. So they can't just get an electronic warrant real quick if you refuse the blood draw in Kentucky. For now, they are, um, the legislature's looking at that the first part of this year they're supposed to, so who knows, that might change. But for right now, um, they can't force you to do a blood draw, basically. In Kentucky, at least. Good to know. Go back to our friend, the uh, unlucky uh, 
suspect here. Let's see what he does wrong. He does a few things wrong here. Yeah. Hey, you wait up. Wait before you step out. Do me a favor. Just keep your hands on the steering wheel for me. All right. So there's going to do. He's going to open up the door. Look how far this cop is leaning into the vehicle. He's like basically in the vehicle. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I want you to face him and slowly come down, okay? Come out. And I'm going to explain to you why. Okay? Don't make any any movements, anything. Okay? Don't make it. Don't. Watch that. It's fine, it's fine. So he immediately puts his hands behind his back. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. He knows the routine. He's been here before. <laughs> I think I've done this. <laughs> All right, come on. Let's go. Get this over with. I remember this. What is that over here? No, no, don't go for it. I just saw you something here. Yeah, I saw it. I just. What is this? That's my money. That's it? Yeah. Okay. Here's the deal. Before I stopped you, I saw you making movements. I think you were spraying. I don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't know if spraying is reasonable that, suspicion. Must no, be. That sounds, that, that sounds like nonsense. Uh, yeah. That's, uh, well, he spraying, wasn't wearing a yeah. seatbelt. That is reasonable yeah, man, suspicion. Uh, yeah, the seatbelt is. But also, this, this body cam footage is important. I mean, you know, the cop can do this after the fact in, in a stop, say, oh, well, change his reason for pulling you over. But if they have it on video, and this video got brought up in court, that they pulled him over because he was spraying, um, you know, that's, that's not a reason to pull somebody over. Hey, man, maybe I, maybe he's been eating chili for the past three days. You know, you never know. Yeah, that seemed a little, that seems a little sus to me. Yeah. It's... I mean, I know about the spraying. I mean, anybody smokes pot back in the day. Yeah. The spraying but was a thing. It, it, it could be that. It could be any number of other things. And the cops could don't be, know. They're, they're could looking be a can at of you duster, through you never a know. window. Yeah, so. It looks suspicious. That's why he handcuffs right now, because I don't know if guns, any guns inside the coin no, thing. No. Okay, so I see him plain view. Uh, so let me do this to you first. Uh, you have the right to remain silent. Anything yeah. you say can be used against you. So he had a joint, uh, plain view. That's what he's talking about here. So that's a big mistake, obviously. You don't have shit laying out in plain view. Right this is a medical state. This is in Florida. I have a lawyer so, present but... with you in a question. Okay. If you can't afford a lawyer, won't be pointed for you to represent you. All this means you have to talk to me at all. If you decide to talk, talk to me, you may stop talking to me at any time, okay? okay? I walk up, I see you spraying. Nowadays, 2020 is very unsafe because we don't know. Why are you spraying? You probably got some weed inside the car, which is yeah. not a big deal. Okay. Do you have a um, medical marijuana card? Anything? No, I just have a little bit. No, it's fine. Right there. Okay. And this is just money? Yeah, that's you mind fine. if I retrieve it? Yeah. Okay. Bam. So he asks oh, him if he can money. retrieve it, and he says yes, I guess. Yeah, that money is gone, buddy. Dude. You'll never see that fuck again. Fuck yeah, it's gone. It's civil forfeiture. Civil forfeiture. Civil asset forfeiture. What's it called? Civil asset forfeiture? Yeah, but they mention here that it's enough money to confiscate here in a few minutes when he goes back to his cruiser. He's talking with the sergeant. So I wonder yeah, if in yeah, Florida just... there's a certain limit before they can start stealing it. We don't want the small bills. We want 20s and 100s, uh, maybe. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I didn't know this. Was, so you do make the movement, and then I see yeah. the bulging, uh, and I'm like, man, is that a gun? You know what no, I'm saying? It's, that, uh, that's, it's a packet. Oh, so we white don't know what's going on. You know what I'm saying? How much? It's um, 2,000, uh, 2, 3,000. No, wait a minute. Yeah. Go ahead. Anything else? Like skis? Don't walk around with cash like that in your pocket, dude. That's so stupid. Yeah, move it. Hide that shit in your car. He's gonna move it. He's gonna move so he can go. What a, what do you what a novice. Here? Yeah, my, my own boy. It's because I was like, what was that? Yeah, I'm stopping for you, Bell. I'm stopping you for for your tent, which I know it's illegal. I'm going to show it to you how illegal it is. Um, we have had a lot of shootings lately, so here's the deal. I don't care about the little weed. All I care about is getting all these people, getting these guns off the street, make sure kids stop dying, adults, all this bullshit going on. That's that's why. That's why you go trying to get these guns off the street. That's.
I mean, this officer literally has a gun, so I don't know what he's talking about, really. Yeah. You're gonna see us stopping for like mine infractions. You're gonna be like, man, you're gonna stop me for the tent? Yeah, we yeah. will. Right. Because right. that's that's the, how we're gonna get. That's that's the only way we can kind of get out with people. You know what I'm saying? I have a little smoke right here. So. What was that mushmouth so, gobbledygook so, so he, was he talking about? <laughs> he, he's, he's admitting that we're pulling people over for tents because yeah, exactly. that's the way we can get them out and search yep. them for guns. Yep. How is that not like the most giant, oh my God, just completely. Everybody's like, oh, that makes sense. Right. Yeah, we got to get the bad guys, you know. <laughs> so we're just going to make stuff up to pull over law-abiding citizens. Those tent, Those tent laws, you know. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> okay. Oh. I got you. I appreciate you. What's going on? I bet you, I bet you do appreciate uh, it. So, again, he's he had a joint out in the open, and the smell of weed were the two probable cause, so he just searches the vehicle without asking him at this point. Hi. Oh, they way down there, Santa. If it comes in this way, then we. I'm gonna give it to I think it's Wallace Bear. Where's your floor then? Going through his wall. Where's your Florida deal? Right here. Right. Any more money? This is so upsetting. It's so disturbing. It's almost. I mean, it's they're, they're basically just, legal. It's basically they're, legal. They're, at this they're point. thugs. They're yeah, thugs. Exactly. Exactly. Some, they're coming up with some. Uh, just flimsy right. pretense to give them the slightest bit of, of legal leeway to to shake this guy down and, and so that they can maybe get a promotion because they got enough bust and met their quota for the month. It's just vile. Fucking cops are vile. Organized crime. Yeah, they're criminals. Yeah, let's get these thugs off the street. Well, he's about to he's about to commit another error here. So watch. What are you doing? Delivering to your friend? No, it was my first time. How? Tell me how? Tell me how much? How 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 much is the? How much is back? How much you pay? How much you pay for it? How much you pay for it? Did you catch that? Yeah. Just I'm just curious. Curiosity. A thousand. There you go. Bam. There's a conviction right there. Mass, dude. Um, yeah, the cop man. lets him go at the end of this, but um, uh, he gets cited and they take all his shit, obviously. Yeah. Steal his money, steal his weed. Yep. Ruin his night. Well, I guess he had just under a pound. It must be a pound that's um, a felony in Florida because he had just under a pound. So, yeah, he made a few mistakes there. Well, it, was, it was just under a pound. I know in, uh, in Kentucky it's eight ounces. Anything over eight ounces, they consider it. The possession of more than eight ounces is not a hmm. felony, but if you possess over eight ounces, there is an assumption that you are a trafficker, which is so they automatically made. charge you, or that's sufficient evidence to convict you for a felony for uh, trafficking. No, that's what they'll charge you with. They charge okay. you with it, and you know, of course, in, in most cases, you're going to end up pleading out, so they don't have to even go to court and argue their case. But interesting, yeah, you'll get you'll get charged with it because there's an assumption. If you have over eight ounces, based on what? Them. Just based on the quantity? Yeah, just based on the quantity. It's um, so dirty. So that, that's incidentally, that's also the the same reason that growing five or more marijuana plants is a felony, because there's an assumption if you're growing that many marijuana plants that it's going to be for trafficking purposes. So they're basically overcharging, um, yeah, in order to plead down into a a larger sentence. Yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, that's how I beat. Part of the deal, baby. I had, uh, I think it was 23, 23 plants that I got busted with, and uh, I successfully, or my lawyer successfully argued that they were all for my personal use, and that I'm a stingy guy and wasn't going to even let anybody have a joint out of 23 <laughs> marijuana plants. 
the lawyer ultimate. destroyed his own Don't, his own client's character. <laughs> Don't even ask me, James. You're not getting a single <laughs> joint. I'm not going to uh, sale or transfer any of this. And uh, yeah, yeah. So I got to knock down that. Knock I mean, down. as much as you used to stare at them fucking plants, it wouldn't surprise me if you were stingy. Oh, they're so beautiful. <laughs>